So for preserving encryption, uh, be a quick introduction to how it works, not really getting into the technical details about encryption algorithms, but just how it can be used and utilized. So typically you'd have an AES encryption or DES encryption, you take a number like a 16 digit credit card number and you get something like on the right, which is, so you get something on the right, which is, you know, a lot longer. It's actually uh, 65 characters. The input was 16 characters. We get a 65 character AES encrypted value. And, you know, this is a problem. <laughs> so, uh, the back in 1997, some folks looked at this, Smith and Brightwell, one of the first papers on format preserving encryption. They were talking about data type preserving encryption in the context of data warehousing. And they used a quote, which has become fairly common now. They're saying standard encryption, the results of it bear roughly the same res resemblance to plain text as a hamburger does to a T-bone steak. And they focused on like taking the example of, of a social security number, where if you use DES or AES encryption on that, you not only won't get something that looks like a social security number, but it won't be digits anymore. And in the prior example I showed, it's got digits, it's got uppercase letters, lowercase letters, and there are even some special characters in there as a slash and a plus. So if you have a database field that expects to hold a social security number, or a front-end application that expects to display a social security number. Neither of those work with data that's AES or DES encrypted. There's really not a whole lot you could do with that other than decrypt it. So they proposed a solution they call it data type preserving encryption. Today, we call it format preserving encryption more commonly. And what it does is it takes a number like a 16 digit credit card and converts it to a encrypted value like we see on the right, which is another 16 digit number. And once you have something like form preserving encryption, you can apply it not just to credit card numbers, of course, but other PII data types such as social security numbers. This all resulted in March of 2016, a standard publication came out from the National Institute for Standards and Technology. This publication is available um, for download for free. You can see the um, kind of in the center of the document there is the URL where you can download this document if you'd like to board yourself and read it. Um, and then approximately three years later, a revision to that was issued, it really kind of a small update. We'll talk more about that in a second, about why that happened. Um, but it's more or less stayed the same since then. And the, uh, the draft revision from February, 2019 is the current version of the document. So let's look at a code example here. This is using a library, um, an open source library I've made available for free on GitHub. It's in Python, applies NIST approved form preserving encryption uh, using the, the, the FF3 type. And the first part of this in Python is just loading the library, setting up the key, the encryption key, which is 16 bytes in hex and setting up a tweak value, which is eight bytes. Uh, tweaks are used typically in form preserving encryption. There, are, if you know how hashing works, say with salts, the tweak is kind of like an assault. It kind of just uh, adds an additional parameter uh, for varying the encryption. Um, and then this would then instantiate a, uh, a, a cipher object, in this case called FF3, with a radix of 10, 10 being the decimal radix we would use here for decimal numbers. And then we can set up our plain text, such as the, social, uh, the, such as the credit card number we saw earlier. We can encrypt it and we get a cipher text that's the output. Now this is an actual Python example. This is not live Python, I'll show you that in a minute. Um, at the end of the presentation, but um, you can actually download the code, use pip install, run this in Python. If you use the same keys, tweaks, you use my, actually not just my library, use any library, set the radius to 10, you'll get the same output. Um, so 16 digits in, 16 digits out. And if you decrypt it, you of course get the original value back. 
So there's been a bit of history with for preserving encryption. It was a little bit of a bumpy road. Um, at the top here in the timeline, we see in black text kind of what National Institute of Standards and Technology was doing. And in the purple text, we see what the academic community was doing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, kind of started with Brightwell and Smith with their first paper in 1997. Around 2010, um, a little bit earlier, but NIST had asked for submissions for a standard for format preserving encryption. They received three, they rena renamed them uh, colorful names, FF1, FF2, and FF3. After analyzing those and getting public comments, about six years later in 2016, they published that first document we saw. It's got the name 800-38G, NIST Special Publication 800-38G. Uh, it did not approve FF2, um, but it, it did approve FF1 and FF3. Um, unfortunately, as sometimes happens with encryption and hashing standards, um, very quickly, within about a year, there was some academic researchers, uh, Dirac at Rutgers and Vaudenay at the Swiss Federal Institute, who published a paper about how you could break FF3 uh, very quickly. Very quickly, um, the you know, NIST suspended FF3 and said you should be really careful with form preserving encryption. Um, this is caused some of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that exists around it right now. Uh, later in the next year, another paper was published by a different set of researchers. Uh, Hung was at the University of Florida, and it was called The Curse of Small Domains. And it talks about how using format preserving encryption for small domains, such as a zip code or a CCV on a credit card, where you have just a few hundred or a few thousand potential values makes it easy to attack the algorithm. And then kind of the latest thing that's happened is that in February, 2019, NIST has issued a revision to the format preserving encryption standard. Um, they created a slight, slight variant of FF3 called FF3-1. FF1, they uh, found to be reliable and left as is. They did change the domain size. So kind of addressing the concern here of the curse of small domains. And now the domain for preserving encryption is required to be a million or larger. So some limitations on FF, for preserving encryption. Um, you have to choose a radix. So you can choose a radix representing digits, which would be 10 a radix representing monocase alphabet, which would be 26, or alphanumerics representing uh, a radix of 36. It's really not well suited to representing uh, special characters included in that or representing non-US ASCII characters. So the European character set or, or non-Latin character sets don't work very well with form preserving encryption. Also for the plain text, you now have this limitation, which has been up from originally the, the domain was required to be a hundred or more. They've now changed it in 2019 to be a million or more. And there is a limitation on the maximum length of the plain text of between 36 and 56 characters. That depends upon the radix value you select what the actual maximum there is. Now you can always break up your text into chunks and you can, you know, form preserve encrypt each chunk and then concatenate them back together if you'd like. And then the final thing, especially when you're comparing this to maybe vault-based tokenization that some vendors provide is kind of key management where you're gonna now have to keep the keys and the tweaks secure in either some KMS or in some other mechanism so that if you need to decrypt the data and you wish to decrypt the data, you can do so. It's also a possibility to just, you know, throw away the keys and the tweaks and consider it a one-way encryption. And then you can not have to worry about, you know, managing the keys. And finally, a kind of a, an unusual limitation of, or a, a risk, I guess, of not just format preserving encryption, 
but one of the underlying AES standards, which is called ECB, electronic code book. Um, any type of encryption, it takes a single value and always maps it to another value of the same on a small domain, such as the picture here of Tux, uh, um, the Linux mascot. This only has a very small limited color palette. And when we encrypt it, and this is an exact, this is an example a researcher did, when you encrypt those RGB values, you get something like this, where the actual outline of the image is still quite clearly visible. The colors have changed, some of the yellows become blue, um, some of the white have become gray, but nevertheless, you have not really done a very good job of obscuring the image. And it all comes down to having a limited domain set and also the fact that FPE and AES ECB encryption um, do a one-to-one -one mapping where an original value is always the same output value. Other encryption algorithms such as AES, CBC and other ones, uh, you know, would do a better job of, of obscuring the original data input. So use cases, typical PII data, social security number, credit card, phone number, driver's license, um, things it's not good for generally because of the size of the domain would be date of birth, credit card CCV values, pin codes, zip codes, things like that that have a smaller domain, typically less than a million. I wouldn't consider a million a hard cutoff. You know, if you have 900,000, that's probably fine. Maybe 800,000 is fine. Obviously, you have to consider the, um, the degree of, of security you need with your encryption too, if it's for internal use or external use. But the recommendation from NIST is a million at this point. There are some other implementations of data type preserving and format preserving encryption that are out there other than the NIST approved ones. There's a Korean, two Korean algorithms, FEA1, FEA2, published in 2014. I believe they're a Korean national standard now. Um, not too familiar with them and I've not seen implementations. Also various Privacy vendors such as Protegrity have created their own algorithms, Privatar too. Um, and Protegrity kind of got into a, a funny situation where when the NIST algorithms were found to have weaknesses, they said to their customers, no problem, we are more secure than NIST's FPE. You're, you're fine with us. Um, and then some Florida researchers, uh, Hong and Tesaro and True, uh, looked into that claim. They actually asked Protegrity for access to their algorithms, which was provided to them. And so when they were looking at FF1 and FF3, they also looked at Protegrity's algorithm and they found it to be 10 times weaker than the NIST approved ones. And specifically, they found while with the NIST approved algorithms, they were they had vulnerabilities on a small domain size, the Protegrity ones were vulnerable on any domain size and um, you only needed the ciphertext to attack the algorithm. You did not need the known plain text, which was a vulnerability, the, the attack vulnerability they'd found with um, FF1 and FF3 with small domains. So there are at least four implementations on GitHub. Um, of format preserving encryption for different languages. I created one for Python. There's one for Go, there's one for C, and there is one for Java, although it's about four years old and I found it to be a little difficult to use. And I'm actually at this point trying to, re, to, to build a new one in Java. That'd be uh, more straightforward to use. Also, when you use these algorithms, these open source algorithms, which are all free to use, uh, you need to keep in mind that NIST has defined 15, what they call test vectors, we would call probably test cases, where they have a set of um, a plain text together with a key and a tweak with a known encrypted value. And so all of these algorithms do have those 15 test vectors and they should pass those test vectors um, in order to be conformant with the standard. So kind of in summary, you know, FPE is really, 
there's been questions about it, that whole um, back and forth about uh, some academic papers attacking the weaknesses in small domains um, caused some consternation and some folks to back away from FPE. But given this has been, the revision has been published out there for two years now, I think it's uh, reasonable to say that FPE is ready and safe. I think it also seems questionable to use proprietary algorithms that do format preserving or data type preserving encryption, which have not been scrutinized by the community, given what we've seen about attacks on those algorithms once they are published. Um, and for use cases, you know, best use cases are typically primary key PII. You do not want to use format preserving encryption as a general technique for encrypting everything in your in your data set. So as we talked about before, it's not good for birth dates or zip codes or CCV values. So typically you would use form preserving encryption in combination with other um, with other de-identification techniques. And then I was going to bring up a quick example here and then I'll take any questions if we have them. Um, so here we have, this is a Jupyter notebook where I'm running Python. This is real code. Um, this first example, we will just, you know, import the library, set up the key and the tweak value. The ciphertext here will encrypt it and show what the ciphertext is, which is the same I showed in my PowerPoint slides. And we can also decrypt the value here. And since this is actually live code, you know, I can go and change these values and then we'll get you know, different output. I can decrypt that again, and we get the original value back where I changed it with the changing that zero to the one. So that's how the library works, the Python library. Um, you can also include this into a larger de-identification suite. So I've actually built a couple tools here. Um, this is another open source project I'm working on, and here, uh, we'll load a CSV file using pandas. So we can see we have a data set here that consists of typical PII data you might have in a you know, database with first names, last names, zip codes, social security numbers, et cetera. Um, we can run an anonymization function on it, which I've built using FPE and some other techniques. And then you can get a de-identified data set out which I'll display there. So in this data set, we have used FPE on social security number and Canadian social insurance numbers. Um, we've applied different rules with HIPAA for zip code and for generalizing birth date. We've redacted some values. We've masked some values and we've clipped some values. So any questions on the presentation or the Python notebook here. Everybody's on mute. No questions. That was thank you. Thank you, Brad. You're welcome. Um, yeah, so I will um, send the slides out to, to folks. And um, as I mentioned, all those libraries are available and free to use for folks.